shell of Maverick cards, right? We mm -hmm. see, I see, when I'm looking at the deck list, I see Thalia, I see Gaddock Teague, I see none of the Reliquary, Noble Hierarch, but then it takes a little bit of a turn. Yeah, he's got the four Geist of Saint Trapped. He's running three Stoneforge Mystic, which is in contrast to the usual, you know, one or none you'd see in many Maverick lists. Uh, and he has a bit of a, a top end in the two Armageddons and two Elspeth Knight Errant. And in lieu of a Batter Skull, he runs an Umazawa Jitte and a Sword of Fire and Ice. Uh, Maverick doesn't really need Batter Skull, it usually just runs Jitte's, but BBD, like on the sword. So if I look at that, the cards which we, don't norm which we normally see, the Scavenging Oozes, you know, those yeah. are gone. We're seeing Elspeths and an Equipment Package. Would it seems like he's going more for a post again late game. Yeah. Uh, amusingly enough, BBD has told me he's about 50-50 to win following the casting on Armageddon, <laughs> which I kind of think is not where you want to be with a, a, a large sorcery and legacy. Could so, contrast to that with show-and-tell players. <laughs> Andrew Kavanaugh is on goblins here, so he leads us off on plateau. No turn one play. Yeah. Uh, both are actually just making dual lands without casting any, any spells, but uh, we'll probably see some action going on on turn two. It looks like Kavanaugh has taken one or maybe even two mulligans here. Yeah, peculiar to see from both players as their decks are filled with one drops. Uh, obviously Goblins has, you know, Vile, Lackey, a few other random ones like, you know, perhaps a Prospector. And BBD is all about the one drops. He's got Noble Hierarchs, he's got Death Raid Shamans. Uh, he, he has Gai Green Sun's Zeniths uh, to search for Dryad Arbors. Uh, but he does not have Mother of Runes, which is a card he cut. Yesterday he had them in the deck, so I, I guess he decided those were not his jam. Yeah, so Andrew Kavanaugh is going to make a first play here in Goblin Pile Driver. He, uh, like Max Teats last round, he's playing a full four Pile Drivers in his main deck. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, there are apparently two schools of Goblin Thought going on right now, which is, you know, the, uh, the double striking Zendikar Goblin Warren Instigator versus Goblin Pile Driver, and I think Pile Driver is currently uh, in vogue. Right. So from Brian, Brian uh, plays a turn to Stoneforge Mystic. He assembles more of his mana base here. It looks like he has a scrub land in addition to the savanna he let off on, and he finds Umazawa's Jite. Jite uh, and Sword of Fire and Ice are both actually quite good against goblins. <laughs> uh, I suppose uh, Jite is probably a little bit better, uh, considering that his opponent's on the play, and thus the life gain might come into being more effective. So what I think interesting about Brian's deck is when he chose the equipment that he wants to run, he uh, he distilled two pieces of equipment, but the first one's GTA, but the second one is not Batter Skull. So mm -hmm. he actually has no Batter it's no Batter Skulls in the main deck, or I believe even in the 75. Uh, he has one Batter Skull in the sideboard, actually. Uh, that is his third and final piece of equipment in the 75. All right, so from Andrew Kavanaugh, we see he adds to his team with the Goblin Lackey, but he's going to have a little bit of trouble pushing through that... Mm -hmm. Uh, the Stoneforge Mystic, at least this turn, he follows up with the Wasteland and then passes the turn back. Uh, well, I kind of think he might have been able to sneak in for a point with Goblin Pile Driver there, as Brian probably has to be scared of a Gem Palm Incinerator. So I just pre combat, you know, don't play the Goblin Lackey and go ahead and attack. Uh, you might, might get in a point, Brian might just call him down and block. Right, at this point, the, the jig's up. If he had the yeah. Gem Palm Incinerator, the he would have just used it. Yeah, yeah, the Mystic would be dead once he played the second card. Yeah, so now Brian has not only knows, you know, he, he's actually certain Andrew does not have a Gem Palm Incinerator. All right, so Brian follows up with a second Stoneforge Mystic, getting his other piece of equipment, which is the Sword of Fire and Ice, and he continues to push his advantage on the board as he green suns on for zero, getting dry at Arbor. Yeah, uh, that's going to give him access to potentially five mana next turn. And considering he's got a Jitte and a Sword of Fire Ice and two creatures active, uh, plus the Dryad Arbor being a potential third, things could get really hairy for Andrew and really fast. Right, so when I think about plays like this, you know, Green Sun's nothing for Dryad Arbor, not a play I really think of when I think Armageddon deck. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, the ramp that lets you enable, you know, turn th turn two Geist of Saint Trap, turn three Geddon, uh, I think the Arbor primarily functions in that role. Uh, it's obviously uh, inconvenient at times, but at the same time, BBD is also a Knight of the Reliquary deck. Uh, Dryad Arbor has always been valuable in those decks as the ability to search out a blocker. In this particular situation, it's a little more awkward because Andrew has access to Wasteland, but Wasteland would, could kill any of BBD's land, so right. the Dryad Arbor is actually probably the, I don't know, third most appealing target on the board, <laughs> with the, the White Lands probably drawing much more of Andrew's f fire. All right, so Andrew, uh, despite being having to be the more aggressive deck here, or wanting to be it, is a little bit on the back foot right now. Um, he's He knows that Brian has an Umazawa's GT in his hand, so he's Cracking Wooded Foothills, grabbing another mountain, uh, still low on cards. As of note, we just confirmed Andrew did start on a five-card mm -hmm. hand here to Brian's seven. So he's down, because he was on the play, also down a full three cards. Yeah, Goblin Ringleader could turn that around, though, and that's what Andrew's playing now. 
reveals the top five. Another and ringleader. Yeah, the second ringleader, Wooded Foothills, a gem palm incinerator, another gem palm incinerator. So a four mana, it draws three, and each of these cards looks like it draws more cards. Yeah, that was actually a really strong ringleader. Even uh, Jitte could actually be overcome by that sheer number of cards. Andrew can, you know, lose one, one or two guys. But uh, the incinerators will draw him cards and keep the Jitte from developing much further. All right, so a swing here by Andrew Kavanaugh. He swings the ringleader and the pile driver. Pile driver will pump up to a 3-2. Brian has an opportunity to trade a Stoneforge Mystic with the pile driver, it looks like. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what I would do here. I, I think that that's fine if you want to run that. Uh, it mostly depends on whether BBD has a fifth land in his hand. If he has a fifth land, I'm fine with it because then I would just immediately slam Sword of Fire and Ice on the surviving Stoneforge Mystic, attack him with that, kill another guy, and that... Out, you know, outlaws all of those gem palm incinerators. You cannot gem palm incinerator a creature equipped with sort of fire and ice, and you know, once the Jitte gets onto that creature as well, it should be lights out or yeah, something very close. Looks to like it. Brian agrees with the play too, as he makes the double block on gem palm incinerator. Uh, Brian's gonna take two, so the score goes to 18-18. But yeah, the one gem palm trades with the Stoneforge Mystic, and we're sounds like we're gonna see a, a hit back with a Jitte. Well, I, I think he needs to do. I think he would like to do sword. Okay, well, if he has sword. A fifth, if he has a fifth land. At least that's just, what I Just for the protection. To do. Yeah, the protection against those two incinerators, because if he slams in with a Jitte, he's then forced on the next turn to make the choice of whether he can try and protect his guy. Uh, he knows Andrew has, you know, another ringleader or, and the two incinerators available. So uh, the Jitte is not quite the protection he might have hoped for. So uh, if I'm getting this, it sounds like, so you'd want to lead out on the sword here at least, because then you can put the Jitte on it later. The, right. Especially he knows he has double gem palm incinerator. Yeah, and that's exactly what BBD lines up here. He's attacking in with for three damage. He's going to get to draw a card. He's going to kill a goblin. And killing a goblin immediately also goes ahead and you know devalues those gem palm incinerators. Right, so that, that, that link up, Brian draws a card, kills a goblin, knocks Andrew down to 15. Uh, that's all he has for the turn, but Andrew's going to have to recover from this situation. Uh, and as a mono red deck, this is a pretty difficult thing to do. He, he's going to have to first do it, I would imagine, by answering the artifact. Uh, yeah, he doesn't have a lot of solutions available. His removal spell in the main deck, Warren Weirding, is currently being blanked by Dryad Arbor. He'd have to Wasteland first, and he doesn't even have the black mana. What's his uh, goblin removal of choice? Tinkerer. Uh, Tinkerer's the slowest of the options. Uh, most people run Tin Street Hooligan, or they run uh, Tuck Tuck Scrapper. Uh, goblin Tinkerer, if I recall correctly, uh, has to tap to destroy his artifacts. Right, which could actually wouldn't really work because of how Sword of Fire and Ice yeah. works. Exactly. Once uh, once you drop Sword of Fire and Ice onto a guy, the two damage going around is going to be trouble, and the Jitte is, of course, going to be even more trouble. Right. So Andrew Kavanaugh with another insane Goblin Ringleader. This one's going to draw four cards. It's going to draw Wart Boggart Auntie, Siege Gang Commander. Um, That's Goblin Tinkerer. Goblin Tinkerer, and the fourth one, I believe, is Mog War Marshal. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, all certainly live-ish. Uh, the problem is Brian has, like, double abyss in play basically uh and he's gonna draw a card every time he connects with it yeah andrew actually doesn't have another land though he has eight cards he's gonna have to move to discard uh the reason you talk about cards like tin street hooligan andrew is doing a double splash which mm -hmm. seems to be kind of the norman goblins uh he is splashing white for thalia's out of the board and then as we saw there he's splashing black for weirding and more importantly for wart boggart mm -hmm. auntie yeah wart's an interesting choice uh, it seems to me personally, at least, that she had fallen out of favor in, once uh, Krenko got printed. Uh, but, you know, still fills a very similar role, and I, I can't really fault someone for playing her, uh, especially if they want access to other black cards on the sideboard. Uh, Cabal Therapy is not an unusual choice. Andrew's not running those, but he does have access to Parish. Parish is a big one. Yeah. So, um, the discard there is Goblin, War it's Mog War Marshal. He's going to pass the turn back to Brian Brondwin. He has two tap. These two goblin ringleaders attacked, putting Brian to 14, and it kind of looks right now like he's going to try to race the Stoneforge Mystic as a poke, since he has no answer to it. Yeah, that's pretty much all he can do, uh, as, you know, Sword plus Jitte is just going to kill all his creatures, and Brian here attacking without equipping the Jitte, that's uh, that's a troubling thing for Andrew, because, you know, he knows the Jitte's there, so that and that's an appealing better. play. Yeah, he has something better than Umazawa's Jitte this turn. All right, so that play's going to be made here, and might we see, and yeah, we are going to see Armageddon from Ryan Brondwin. Yep. And that will be the play, I think, that's uh, better than casting Umazawa's Jitte. Sure, sure sounds like it. It seems like he floated up mana, and he's going to go ahead and play a land and play the Jitte <laughs> now. Uh, and he's like, yeah, hey, okay, Andrew, you were doing all right. Deal with this. <laughs> all right, well, Andrew, yeah, that doesn't even, <laughs> draws a card. Yeah, Andrew and, has one solution for this. Right, so <laughs> Brian good. with the first game. So, interestingly enough, Andrew ha cast two Goblin Ringleaders. I think by all accounts, those are some of the best Goblin Ringleaders I've ever seen. They were good. And uh, still, 
very short order loses the game. Yeah, uh, the issue here is Goblins was very much forced to assume the control role in a position where it wasn't really, you know, inclined to do that. He was on five cards, so he was already a little bit behind, and Brian established very quickly with those Stoneforge Mystics. Not only did they draw him extra cards, but the cards they got were so good. Sword of Fire and Ice just took him apart in a hurry. Now, if he'd had, you know, a Gem Palm Incinerator for those Stoneforge Mystics or something, you know, establish a Tinker before a Sword of Fire and Ice started hitting him, could have been a completely different game, like very, very winnable for Andrew. Uh, the, the ringleaders like that have a habit of putting games away. But he, he didn't have a way to stop what Brian was doing, and in those two turns where Brian seized a gigantic advantage, it put him so far ahead that there was nothing Andrew could do. And so out of the sideboards, which they're going to right now, uh, we noticed that Brian Bronduin is playing, he's playing the Maverick deck, and we have written up their Maverick, though that's a little bit of a misnomer in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, it's not what you'd expect out of a Maverick deck. You already said he's playing Geist of St. Trafts in the main. Uh, and he does have a couple, a pair of Armageddons. Uh, what does he have access to in the sideboard then for this matchup? Uh, his sideboard is actually pretty, pretty common for Maverick, or at least for some of the builds I've seen recently. Uh, I know that Thoughtseize going into Maverick uh, was something I saw Dave Doburn doing in Seattle, uh, in the in the Legacy portion there. He was playing a very Maverickish deck with access to discard being the primary reason he went into black. Uh, and BBD is doing that as well. He has four Thoughtseize in the sideboard, obviously not for this matchup, uh, but certainly an interesting addition. He's also running four Meddling Mage. Again, you know. That's a lot of Meddling Mages. Not this matchup, but yeah, and it's not the first Meddling Mage we've seen uh, this weekend either. I know, right. I think Todd and Brad are both, both running them as well. I wonder if they've, you know, tracked down Chris at the top tables and so is this sucker sign. <laughs> right. So, uh, is this a reaction to the to prevalence of Show and Tell? Yeah, I, I think so. I know personally, uh, Show and Tell is a deck that virtually no one in Roanoke tends to play. Uh, Brad, I think, is the only one who's, who's really given it a go, and uh, they all hate losing to it, though. <laughs> so, so, so Med Meddling Mage is just there to, is there for the most part to name show and tell. Yeah, although Todd said he didn't really like the ones they were running so much in Esper Deathblade, and he's considering replacing them with Iona, Shield of Amarius. Oh, so just uh, instead, just to try yeah. to one-up the show and tell. Uh, it's much, much worse against uh, Sneak and Show, but he thinks that people seem to be audibly mostly towards that End of the Infinite deck, and Iona's a stone-cold beat against them. All right. Uh, the cards that I see BBD bringing in, perhaps in this matchup, uh, he has access to a Kasali Pride Mage, he has Green Sun Zenith, and that's like a reasonable way to dismantle a vial. It's also just, you know, a pretty good two drop. Now, do you feel uh, in this matchup, does Brian, if he sees an Ether Vial from Andrew Kavanaugh, does he need to dismantle the vial, or can he just continue to play against it? I, I think it varies depending on Brian's draw. On the When he is on the draw, it's a much more dangerous card. Uh, because Andrew can do exactly what BBD did to Andrew, get so far ahead on the board that he can't really catch up. Uh, BBD's cards that catch him up are significantly stronger. We saw them in play there, you know, sort of Fire and Ice and uh, Umazawa Jute can both take a lost game and turn it around. Uh, but at the same time, it, it can be tricky, especially with an active vial. Uh, as far as other interesting cards, I think a, a pair of Abrupt Decays might come in for the, perhaps the same purpose. Uh, but they're a little less versatile than Kasali Pride Mage in that, you know, he can't search for them, and they're not a creature that attacks when he doesn't need the effect. Right. So, uh, and Andrew Kavanaugh's sideboard going over to there, uh, not too much you, that you wouldn't expect out of Goblins. Uh, he does have Pyrokinesis, which is typically used, I know, in creature matchups. Uh, the one card which I saw in there, which is interesting, he does have a, well, he has that one Tuk Tuk Scrapper you were looking for. That's actually in his board. He prefers the Tinkerer in the main. And he does also play two Orem's Thunder in the sideboard. Orem's Thunder is a sweet one. I haven't seen that one in a while. Why don't we go ahead and uh, bring that up on screen, if we can. Orm's right. Thunder is a, an invasion common disenchant, or I should say invasion block. I think it's actually from Apocalypse. Uh, but it disenchants, and for a kicker of red mana, throws the damage at one of your opponent's creatures. Right, so Andrew, um, would you, I don't, I'm, I'm curious, I love the card. I'm wondering what it's targeted for, if there's a specific enchantment he has in mind, or whether he's just going to use it in general against artifacts and enchantments? Uh, my guess is it's, it's pretty common for goblins to want access to a disenchant effect of some kind. People have splashed green for crows and grip many times. Just uh, they can't beat batter skull? Right. Uh, it's good against batter skull. It's just you know a reasonable thing to have access to in Legacy. Uh, Moat is stone unbeatable for the deck otherwise, for example. So having outs to a card like that is pretty reasonable. And I you know people tend to just find the option that they prefer. Crows and Grip has been the standard. People have certainly run literal disenchant. Cedric and I did that at uh, the Las Vegas Legacy Open about a year ago, I think. Or so at least I ran disenchant. Having run that, uh, Orm's Thunder, for it to be better than disenchant, you have to use four mana. Yeah. You know, as just a disenchant, it costs three, but for four, you can get a pretty good kicker. Um, comparing the two, how, does Goblins, how much time does Goblins have to disenchant? Well, the trick is, it's not just four mana. Your opponent also has to have a creature that's worth, you know, the, using that fourth mana. Otherwise, it is strictly worse. 
So uh, I'm I'm personally not a big fan of the choice of Worms Thunder, although my money is on the fact that Andrew, you know, tried it out, found out he liked it uh, in a couple of key spots. A deck like Brian's seems like an ideal spot for it, to be honest. And speaking of Worms Thunder, we do see it in Andrew's opening hand. He is on the play. He has a two-land hand, a little bit of a one that he has to think about, as the only lands in it were Wasteland and Cavern of Souls. Yeah. And it turns out he doesn't have to think about it at all. It's going to six. Now, if that hand had an Aether Vial in it, Andrew can keep it. And that's one of the strengths of the Disenchant things in, uh, in Brian's sideboard is it can punish Andrew for these aggressive keeps. Goblins is a deck filled with a lot of colorless lands, uh, caverns, wastelands, and, um, of course, Rashadden ports. And Aether Vial is one of the ways that you hedge against getting color screwed. And if you can destroy those, you can actually sometimes catch the Goblins player without an ability to play spells. Yeah, interestingly enough, the Goblins deck has 22 lands, 10 of which are colorless, so almost half his lands do not, I mean, yep. do not produce colored mana. Well, the Caverns produce it to cast Goblins, but, you know, to cast actual spells. So when we look at the number of white sources Andrew Cavanaugh actually has for splashed white cards, he has uh, a Plateau, uh, he has some three wooded foothills, two bloodstained mires, and that's actually it. He only has six white sources in the deck. Hmm. That's that's a little light, uh, I, I feel like. Well, for white spells. If we yeah, count yeah. Thalia, he gets out, he, that six goes up to nine thanks to Cavern And, you souls. know, a vial can certainly slide in a Thalia. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind in this matchup is that having actual, you know, real red mana is a little more important because uh, cycling Gem Palm Incinerator is very key. Being able to kick those uh, Orm's Thunders, that's going to matter. Uh, also, just having a basic mountain uh, against a deck that you know many people would assume runs Wasteland. BBD does. He has four. Uh, it, it matters. You know, you, you don't want to just be stuck without the ability to play your spells, or even worse, you know, play your relevant spells. That's the worst. Right. So both players actually keeping on six. Andrew Cowan's going to lead off on Bloodstain Mire. It's looking like this is going to make Goblin Lackey. Uh, my interesting whether he'll get he could get Mountain Plateau or Badlands. Interesting to see which way he'll go with it. Yeah, I saw him pass a Plateau and a Badlands. So that implies Mountain, and yep, there he goes. All right. And typically on land light hands, I think you'd, Andrew would do this just because he needs to protect himself from Wasteland. Yep, and that's a wise choice. So you see Goblin Lackey for him. It appears like he has a sec, possibly, he has a Goblin Matron at least in his opener and yep. another land. Uh, it looks like a Wasteland. A uh, Tuk Tuk Scrapper, a Goblin Matron, and then two one, goblin two Goblin Matrons. matrons. Yep. Okay, I would agree. Uh, Brian has a turn one play of his own. Uh, it's going to be a Dryad Arbor. Actually, a and not only is it a turn one Rascal, <laughs> it's also an answer to that Goblin Lackey. Yeah, uh, BBD's like, you, you want to attack? I, I got that guy locked up. <laughs> uh, Andrew, of course, has the answer already at the ready in Wasteland, and BBD knows Goblin's play is you know, Wasteland and Rashad Port. He probably is not expecting this Dryad Arbor to necessarily... Uh, run full blocks on Goblin Lackey, but at the same time, might as well give it a try. All right, so Andrew with no, uh, no, I mean, he's in a wasteland here. He has no other lands outside of this wasteland, so this Lackey may be the way he gets most of his goblins into play. Yeah, uh, he just drew what I thought he just drew. He just drew like a Siege Game Commander for the turn. Um, you know, that's the card, I think, which people, you know, of all the things you've been lacking to play, Siege Game's got to rank pretty high on the list. Yeah, and it's also one of the cards that really, you know, we talked about how important it is to have an actual mountain in play. Uh, you can't cavern of souls to throw goblins at your own creatures. You have to actually tap red mana for it. And Andrew fetching up that mountain, plays around wasteland, and now the next land he has will turn any of those goblins into a shock, keep that lackey rolling in. BBD is really far behind. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Andrew, Andrew, Andrew <laughs> played a five drop on turn two, and no slouch five drop at that. Uh, we see that BBD did bring in the Abrupt Decay. There's one at the bottom of his uh, deck right there. And uh, keep in mind the thing with the Siege Gang Commander is BBD's playing under the assumption that his next couple of plays will actually be blanked by Siege Gang Commander because he knows all Andrew needs to do is play a land, chuck a goblin token at whatever BBD plays. What yeah. he doesn't know is Andrew doesn't have another land, so right. BBD has Andrew a much the, higher chance of getting in. Andrew played the Wasteland last turn, so he hasn't learned that yet. He Brian plays uh, this turn a Thalia, which is actually out of the sideboard. He's chosen to side this in against goblins, despite the fact that goblins is a mostly creature deck. Oh, he has Thalia's in the main act. Yeah, he, he's starting all four. The, the Goblin's deck is sideboarding Thalia. Right. Uh, and I imagine he just didn't have anything really worth taking these out. They are first strikers. They shut down Pile Driver. Uh, it, it's a creature-laden matchup. Yeah, it's amusing because Brian has a lot more non-creature spells than yes. Andrew does in the matchup. So it actually kind of hurts him to have this creature. In, in fact, BBD, when he was first designing the skeleton for this deck, I, I mentioned that he was running Mother of Runes. One of the cards he wasn't running was Green Sun Zenith. Uh, I, I suggested he, that he might want to try it out. But he was very uncomfortable with the idea of running, you know, fourth Thalia main and Zeniths and Gaddens and Elspeth. It's just really awkward. So Andrew, uh, shut down by the Thalia, doesn't play anything else to the board. Uh, he doesn't even hit his land. Brian also is stuck on two lands, but he plays Deathrite Shaman, Noble Hierarch, which two cards that make mana. And 
I think it's fair to say with Andrew missing two land reps that Brian is pretty much equalized on the board. Yeah, I would go so far as to say he's ahead. Uh, that one turn where that Thalia got to live and BBD didn't have to take, you know, what, is, what would it be, five damage and another summon from a Goblin Lackey, that's a lot. Uh, right. So BBD can now just play a Knight of the Reliquary, has access to even more mana than that. So if Andrew hit the land that turn, he would have burned the Thalia, he would have been able to swing for five and then get a Lackey trigger? Yeah. Which, you know, that's a pretty heavy snowballing advantage. I imagine it would be very difficult to lose from that position because BBD's next line would be something like, you know, Mana Dork, Mana Dork, take a bunch more damage, lose one of my Mana Dorks, right. uh, face another Lackey trigger. And because we know Andrew has, you know, multiple Matrons in hand, each of those Lackey triggers is very dangerous. All right, so we see uh, that, as you were mentioning the play, we see Knight of the Reliquary cast by Brian Bronduin. He uses all three of his lands to do it, leaving up Deathrite Shaman and Noble Hierarch. And looks like immediately exiling. Yep, cast uh, Kasali casting Pride exiling Mage. land from Andrew's graveyard to cast Kasali Pride Mage. And here it's mostly just a warm body, as you know Andrew doesn't have a vial. But you know, as we stated during the sideboarding discussion, a warm body is totally fine in this matchup. Most of Andrew's creatures, uh, without their effects, are just just goblins. <laughs> now Andrew has drawn one of the card of our, uh, cards off his board this turn. He's drawn Pyrokinesis, and even though it costs one more due to Thalia, he still has one land that's actually able mm -hmm. to cast this. Remember that's four damage divided anyway. He could take out three creatures it looks like with this one card. Yeah, last turn this Pyrokinesis would have just cleared BBD's board straight up. Uh, it would have destroyed Death Rich Shaman, Thalia, Noble Hierarch, and perhaps given Andrew exactly what he needed once more, he may be a turn too late. Right. Andrew choosing to instant speed the Pyrokinesis. Interestingly, so that gives Brian the chance to untap with his mana creatures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but he's holding up, just ships the turn back, still with one land in play. Uh, BBD drew a Detention Sphere and gave it a little flick as he put it in his hand. <laughs> he's probably pretty happy about that. It, it'll most likely kill these three goblin tokens, and uh, he's going to go ahead and cast it. I right, say so Detention Sphere is down. Uh, when this resolves, he is going to name Goblin Token, so all three <laughs> of those leave. Interesting, interesting. If you're Andrew, do you pyrokinesis here to hit one of your to hit one of your own goblins, and then some of Brian's things? I think that that's a totally reasonable line, uh, and it looks like it's what Andrew is going to consider doing. Note the BBD did have to pay four for that Detention Sphere. Andrew now paying the one extra for his pyrokinesis. He's going to zap his goblin token, yeah. just as you described. Zap the Thalia. Zap yeah. the Noble Hark, and then so yeah, nothing. Yep, four damage is going to be, yeah, two to Deathrite Shaman, one to Thalia, one to Goblin Token. Uh, leaving the Noble Hierarch alive, um, so a two for yeah. two. It, it looked like he was going for the Hierarch. He appears to have changed his mind and gone for the Deathrite Shaman. Uh, there are a ton of lands in BBD's graveyard, so that's probably a wise decision. All right, Brian uh, tanking on the play. He does have one mana available in Deathrite Shaman. Uh, not sure how many one mana responses he actually has to this play. He also has the choice of, you know, I guess... Sacking a land to Knight of the Reliquary and activating Deathrite Shaman to Exile Dryad Arbor for two life. That's right. the only other discernible thing he could really do. Uh, decides none of those things are really worth doing. Right, so he sounds to, looks to me like he wants to be protecting Knight of the Reliquary yeah. into a certain level. Um, does he have you know a Sajiri step or any, anything else to protect it with? Uh, no, he has nothing quite that tricky. Uh, he's he's mostly run-of-the-mill lands here beyond what we've seen as far as duels and wastelands He does have horizon canopy dried arbor crocus. Those are only like truly unique lands and here He's keeping his knight uh, at any time. He you know He could just turn it into a 6-6 and that's pretty much fully protected against gem palm incinerator in this position yeah, So Andrew's still not finding his second land I think it's the fourth fourth turn where he doesn't do it on end step Brian's gonna sacrifice tropical island which, that's his source of blue mana, well, one of his sources of blue mana, and it looks like he's going to get Horizon Canopy with it. Yep. Uh, he has Noble Hierarch to keep him, you know, in blue mana, <laughs> as they say, but uh, he only has a few cards in hand, and I imagine he'd be pretty keen to find one of his uh, sweet pieces of equipment that would certainly just put this game out of commission mm -hmm. in a hurry. So does Brian need to find more cards right now, or can he actually win with just what's on the board? I think that it's certainly possible for him to win with what's on the board, but it would, you know, be a, gr a bit of a grind fest. He'd have to, you know, attack and block kind of carefully. Uh, he doesn't want to avoid. He doesn't want to expose uh, his knight or even, you know, necessarily his Quasali Pride Mage because those are the only creatures that can actually attack. So he, yeah. he's kind of going slow. All right. Well, Brian's gonna he, after his draw, he's gonna replace the Deathrite Shaman that was killed. Uh, Captain Savannah still has Horizon Canopy up and one card remaining in hand, and it looks like he's going to attack with Kasali Pride Mage, which is now double exalted thanks to itself and the Noble Hierarch. Yep, that's a 4-4. A four, four. Andrew's going to certainly take the damage. His goblin tokens are still more valuable than uh, 4 life. 
but that's going to change in a, a couple of turns if he doesn't find a land. Another draw from Andrew Kavanaugh. It's finally something he can cast, but it is not the land. It is another Goblin Lackey. Uh, really just a 1-1 one -one at this point. Yeah. Uh, despite that strong start, Goblin Lackey has basically been blanked by Brian's deck as it you know just fields a million creatures. All right, so Brian, a couple options. He's going to first... Uh, first sacrifice the Horizon Canopy on the end step. Still, and still has one mana available in his Noble Hierarch, or two mana with Noble Hierarch and Knight of the Reliquary. Opts not to use either of them. Yeah, I don't think he wants to thin his deck at this point. He did just draw a Stoneforge Mystic, so he's probably looking to just cast it, get one of his sweet pieces of equipment, and preserve the amount of mana he has to guarantee that he can play and equip it, even if his Stoneforge Mystic were to theoretically die. So the draw for turn uh, is going to be Wooded Foothills. Brian plays Stoneforge Mystic, or sorry, the draw off the draw for, for the turn. Yeah, it was what it put yeah. The Stoneforge Mystic was off the Horizon Canopy, Correct. and it looks like he's going to grab. He's looking at Batterskull, and he's looking at Sword of Fire and Ice. I imagine he's going for Sword of Jitte. Yeah, the, the Batterskull seems a little redundant here, especially because as soon as Andrew draws a second land, Siege Gate Commander can effectively turn it off uh, by flinging whatever Goblin blocks it, and you know the board will be stalemated, and BB will have put Andrew into the abyss. But at the same time, he's not you know, actually progressing nearly as much as Jitte would. So interesting enough, it looks like Brian's going for a very aggressive option. He has, uh, he's sacrificing his, what, his, uh, sacrificing a fetch land to go ahead and grab a duel. If he uses all his creatures, he has enough mana to play and equip mm -hmm. the Jitte onto Kasali Prime Mage for a swing. Yeah, and with Andrew tapped out this turn, that's about as good as it gets. He only really has to fear a Pyrokinesis. And he's already seen Andrew play one of those, and he has to know that that one was drawn basically that turn, because on the turn before, that Pyrokinesis would have been insane. <laughs> right. And we see him go through all the steps. So, tapping, removing removing a land from Abdu Kavanaugh's graveyard, from with Deathrite Shaman, tapping Noble Hierarch, and now tapping Knight of the Reliquary, sacrificing the Tundra, grabbing yet another land untapped for the sixth mana of the turn that he needs to equip the Dumazau's Jitte. And on the way to do it, he's going to go ahead and throw a Misty Rainforest in the graveyard. Sure, why not? Go ahead and grow that knight a little bigger. Uh, at this point, BBD has gone through five of the eight dual lands in his deck, so that's worth keeping in mind. Four knight activations, but at the same time, that guy doesn't appear to be shrinking anytime soon. Right, and once knight gets to this level, it seems that the goblin deck has, the answers to it are few and far between. Mm -hmm. So we'll see it suited up to Kasali Pride Mage, and he's going to exalt up, up to a 4-4 again on the attack. Andrew decides to take the damage. Uh, anything else would basically result in the complete and total destruction of his board. Uh, the question is, what will BBD do with these Jitte counters? Uh, so two Jitte counters on the Umazawa's Jitte. Andrew drops to 11 from the attack. And he only has Stoneforge Mystic on defense. Uh, and the thing is, even if Andrew you know, draws a second land, he'll be able to theoretically gem palm incinerator the Stoneforge Mystic out of the way should Brian you know, kill the Siege Gang Commander. Yeah, does Brian know about a gem palm incinerator? He doesn't, but it's a reasonable expectation at this point that you know, it could just kill a Stoneforge Mystic. Andrew so. had to have something in his hand if he's yeah. not drawing lands. Gotta have something. So he, he probably just decides yeah. to hold the two counters so that if something happens, he can kill the lackeys. And if Andrew just you know can't do anything, then BBD doesn't have to do anything either. Andrew decides enough is enough. His next draw, taunting him almost, is another Goblin Lackey. Yeah. Uh, now that he can't answer the Umazawa's G-Day, he scoops his cards, and Brian Brondwin is the victor, two games to zero.